I'm just testing it. So how are we We're told it's pretty good and it um, basically is automatic, you know, plugged into the room, so that's been a real advantage. So um, look everybody, this is wonderful. We're so pleased you've come and uh, we'd really like to welcome everyone warmly. We hope it's going to be a really constructive, imaginative sort of night where we hear what the issues are, what the community concerns are. We are having four guest speakers, one after the other, and um, probably the tavern has been very generous, so I'm going to do a little tiny bit of housekeeping here. But the toilets are up there on the right-hand side. As you go out, you'll find them. And then also, um, because of their generosity, there's meals available afterwards. Run on the kitchen till 8.30, so depending on how hungry you are or whether you just want to drink some coffee, that's you know, great from our point of view because they've been very generous in giving us the room. Now, they've been very generous because I'm from DDEC and we have no money, but we do fight hard with what we've got. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to go through that and give you a little spiel about who's organised it and why. So my name is Jenny Rifnell and I'm from the Darling Downs Environment Council. You can see our banners, which we've had, you know, a little office. Our, our office, for anyone who hasn't been there, is in the Australia Arcade. So just where you've got Duggan Street, if you go in there, you'll find a very small office. That's us. And we um, do a lot with the little, as I said. So um, just with respect to um, uh, the actual structure of the event, I should tell you, we've got funding from the Queensland Conservation Council. That's what pays the rent and a part-time worker. And um, we've got a lot of volunteers. So if you're interested in volunteering and getting involved, please see us afterwards. Um, we've got pamphlets and membership and all sorts of things. So um, the committee of um, making up the DDEC um, committee at the moment is um, all sorts of like-minded people who really care, and they really care about the environment. So we've got the Trauma Bushwalkers, we've got the Trauma for Climate Action, we've got Wildlife Rescue Rehabilitation Education Association, that's Trish Lahong, who's a carer. We've got the Community Capacity Building Group, that's our First Nations group for Trauma and um, representing the group the, um, by the local community is Brianna Humes, who's over here on my right hand side. She's going to do acknowledgement to country very soon. So um, we've also got the Wilderness Society, and as part of the Queensland Conservation Council, we've got Dr. Linda Selby. She comes up to visit us once a month from Brisbane. And um, a name that all of you will know, uh, where DDEX focused a lot of time and attention, is the Oakley Coal Action Alliance because that big hole on the western side of town is getting bigger. So um, finally, not last but not least, we've got Protect. Protect was a group started a few years ago and it's now um, being auspiced by the Dancing Bear Cafe. Some people might remember the Dancing Bear, um, very alternate sort of um, group who basically created a bit of a nightlife for the young people in Toowoomba 40 years ago. So, <laughs> they're still alive and well. And, they help me sell cakes once a month, um, and then with that money we purchase koala trees. Okay, so uh, other groups I'd like to mention to are friends in this government. Not on the committee this year. Not on the committee next year, this year, but um, very much part and parcel of staff after the Redwood campaign. Um, a new group who's joined us is Care for Esk, because you appreciate there's not much for small groups outside of Brisbane. So where DDEC can, DDEC does. And so we've um, embraced Care for S, S because similarly they've got rare wallaby and koala on that beautiful mountain behind S. Um, and it's going to be maybe mountain bike racing, but we're hopeful they're fighting that. So it just it does interfere with habitat, as you all know. And um, you know that's not what we like. Um, a group who's emerged recently is High Country Koala Action Group. Uh, that's a crow's nest group. And they're newly emergent. <coughs> the reason being is that We've got real estate developers looking at crow's nest. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand to Bree. She'll do acknowledgement country. I'll come back and I'll explain a bit more. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name's Brianna Humes. I'm a proud Mungam, Gwyneth Shamara, Rajari and Jaap woman. I'm honoured to be doing Acknowledgement to Country on behalf of the Darling Downs Environmental Council and as a proud committee member. Um, by the special permissions from Shannon and his brother Conrad, who unfortunately can't be here today, but also from the Bunny People's Original Corporation. 
So with that being said, um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the West Waka Waka peoples, the Gaibu peoples, and the Jawa peoples, whose song lines have traversed these lines on which we meet today. I pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging, for they hold the knowledge, the rich traditions, and the evolved ambitions of Australia's first peoples. I, I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bree. And we're very proud to tell you, Bree, it was news breaking today that some of our koala trees are going with Gullum Guru, Gullum Guru the second one. So um, we've got some really good planting uh, collaborations happening at the moment. So um, just um, moving on, um, I was telling you about all our groups, and now I'm going to tell you about why we got here to where we are tonight. So I had heard about people being concerned about Reese Road, and I couldn't get a thread on it. So I was making a few phone calls and I was sort of told it's all too late, should have been there five years ago. And I heard that there was a group there five years ago and I looked up an article, the Courier Mail had covered it, of people trying to stay development. So, so anyway, then all of a sudden I heard all the trees were down. Now, you know, knowing, you know, I'm an interwomber, I've been torn forever, um, but um, everyone who is interwomber just escapes it by coming north. Um, we head to Highfields, we head to Crow's Nest, we head to Hampton, all the pretty spots, and we have a swim at Crow's Nest National Park. So, Toowoomba rides love the north of Toowoomba. Not to say we don't like the south, but really, why do we love it? Because it's very green, it's got all the beautiful aspects, and we probably have just taken it for granted. So, when I was just telling you about the high country koala group, um, if you look at an aerial map of Crow's Nest, you can see the koala corridors. You can also see the land that the developer has purchased and you can see his intention to make it a concrete, intense housing development. Um, and, and these are like, you know, we know the national icon is endangered, so these are walking trails for koalas through not only their golf course, but their school. Um, Sandy, my partner, and I went for a walk around the Bullockies, um Apple Gum Trail, and we spotted three, and we're just like, you know, we sort of in our 60s and we never had really seen wild koala until we went, they're endangered? Oh my God, we've got to do something. So started to take an interest. And once you take an interest, it really catches on. And so there was a great koala camp out there uh, last, uh, last <coughs> so, Sunday? Sunday. Anyway, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and um, we all met out there and were given our instructions. And there's another area of Pittsworth, Yarran Lee, and the koalas there are like olives on toothpicks. Does anyone know what I mean by that? The trees are so sparse and the broad acre is so unimpressive because it's cotton that you can walk along and you'll see a koala, a gum tree, a gum tree, a koala. A, you know, they are like, you know, it's pretty easy to spot koala out there. In fact, they laughed about heat monitoring devices. They said, we don't need them. We've got koala, but we've got no forest. So I read somewhere last week when I was in Brisbane, I bought this wildlife in the balance text. And it talks about the stress levels of koala in that sort of situation being 15 times higher than koala who have actually got in a country like a like crow's nest. So, you know, it's just, it's, yeah, I won't go on, I get too upset. So, um, with respect to what I'm going to tell you next is um, that, um, I'm sorry, there's been a breeze blowing through here, all that paperwork's been blown away. It's a bit of a um, comedy, really. Um, so tonight, many of the questions we'll examine will relate to simple justice. Uh, where is the balance? Where's the give back? This justice for our natural, very innocent world and environmental legislation, you know, doesn't seem to, it's a, we've got the Environmental Protection Biodiversity Act. It's, uh, there was attempts to dilute it last year with the last government to make it state level again. Um, that's been resisted at all costs. Um, we've got the Nat Nature Conservation Act in Queensland, and I'm told by the local Department of Environment Science that if you can prove something's an animal home, you know, it shouldn't be destroyed, that should be protected. So the example there would be a hole for a galah in an old tree. So you take a photo of the hole, and you take a photo of the nest. Now, pretty tricky with koala, because they sit on a branch. One day they're there, the next day they're probably five miles away. Um, not maybe that far, but they move. So um, we just have to learn all this stuff, how to document our wildlife and how to get it onto iNaturalist. So if, you don't, if you've not explored the apps in iNaturalist, please do. And any time you see a wild animal, just photograph it with a smartphone and document it. It should go through the common law, and from there it should go through the wild in Queensland. 
because at the moment we've got the Queensland government saying to us, oh, there's no records up there, up there. And then, <laughs> and then they also say um, that um, basically um, in 10 years' time, they're not going to be there anyway because of climate change. So I reckon we might not be either. <laughs> so, but Koala have got a gloomy future with regards to climate change. And so we seem to be a bit of a kind of shrugging of shoulders. So that's exactly what I said. I said, I think we all want to try. Um, so the rules and punishments are not working, they're not well coordinated, and they're often nonsensical. So my example there is that um, a stand of trees where Koala um, and Joey were known to breed um, out at Brookstead was felled. We went to the Chronicle and we were on the pitch on the front page of a page in the Chronicle where we did a vigil because it was illegal felling. So uh, the chap at the Chronicle said to me, he seemed like a reasonable bloke and he was doing it legally. And I just thought, well, not might be legal, but we held a vigil anyway because from our point of view, it was a morning of 100 trees. Um, they were piled up in a pile. The only reason I was still there was because it was wet and you couldn't burn them. Otherwise, the evidence would have been gone as well. So. You know, we took lots of photos and we tried to get to as public as we could. I don't think he liked us for it, but never mind. And so, um, so elected governments in all levels, all persuasions, don't seem to be listening hard enough. I think that's what we're saying. And um, climate change is now the biggest threat to human health. So that's something that really needs to be said tonight as well. Economic development and habitat for attention are not easy bed for us. And when environmental impact statements make conclusions, and I think this Think, I really need to check it's been a bit busy lately. Um, sorry, native vegetation. So yeah, the environmental impact statements often conclude that the native vegetation, and we presume this means big gum trees, is not suitable for urban development. So with that, native vegetation is food. So we don't have if we're going to have every development with concrete and ornamental pears, um, they might look pretty, but they're not very edible. And I think we've got a bit of a problem for our wildlife. So we end up with concrete jungles. They're very easy to hose down and keep clean, um, but no food for you, possums, wallabies, echidna, and the myriad of animals that are dependent on native vegetation. And um, that's often an understory. I think we've become a very clean nation where we like to everything to be tidy and uh, set up in a nice Japanese kind of aesthetic. But um, the Australian bush is messy, untidy, it does leak, and um, it's full of snakes, it used to be, not at all. Um, and so you know, people really like to have, you know, their acreage is cleaned and mowed, and, and, and it's, it's kind of like we just haven't learnt, you know, um, wildlife habitat 101 or something, we should do that in grade one perhaps. Um, but um, I'm saying me and we, the community, are super frustrated. Uh, we don't know what to do. We don't know when these massive developments are happening, what time frames and how to object. We're not taught that at school. And probably what I'm going to say here is that we're busy. Like, staying afloat financially means most people are just super busy, head down, paying bills and taxes to keep our country afloat. So we need a bit of help with this stuff. We do want to keep our wildlife. We do want to keep our vegetation. And um, we want to say to the government that we want all those big departments with all those very complicated documents to help us figure out how to do that. So um, the High Fields community expressed their disgust about Reese Road and the verge being scorched earth. All the wildlife was scattered. So I got lots of calls that day. And um, I've had some great people also um, do some leafleting around here to let people know that this is on. So, um, Right now, I'm handing to Scott McPhee. Scott McPhee is an ornithologist, amongst other things, and he was um, very, very um, active in producing a petition which um, uh, quickly um, reached um, almost 7,000. So I'll hand over to Scott now, and he can explain the rest. Yeah. I'm organised for the venue to bring more chairs because there's a lot of people standing outside, so yeah. just a three-second break, and we're going to bring it through that door. Oh. Okay, I'll go ahead and Okay, so I'll just let them know. Sorry. Yeah, stop it. Uh, okay, so anyone who would like a seat, see Councillor Shine down there, and <laughs> Councillor McDonald, you might like to come in. Oh.
we'll just give it a minute for these chairs to come. We're a bit more popular than we thought we would be, so apologise for that. who are here, Deputy Mayor Jeff McDonald, uh, Councillor Kerry Shine, unexpected, thank you for coming, and uh, Councillor Megan O'Hara Sullivan, and is Nancy Summerfield here? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah. apologies, thank you Nancy. Okay. And Councillor Bill Cale, who will be giving a talk. <laughs> uh, sorry for listening. I, I think that's everyone now, so. Um, the, the structure of the night is uh, there will be about half a dozen speakers, everyone's going to speak for about 10 minutes and then the, the conclusion of each, each speech we'll just throw it open for questions, just uh, two or three minutes if we can, just to try and keep moving through this. Uh, and then at the end we'll just have a, an open discussion if any members of the public have any other issues or anything else they'd like to raise. Um, obviously we expect everyone to be polite and respectful with no interjections during a speech but uh, you certainly got the opportunity to raise any points you'd like to afterwards, okay. Um, and now also you'll notice something this is being filmed, does anyone have, particularly the speakers, but does anyone have a problem with this being filmed? Uh, it's probably going to end up on YouTube. Um, most of the cameras are just centred on this area so if you don't want to be filmed just stay out of this area basically. Um, so the purpose of tonight, it's it's not a talk fest uh, and it's not a feel good exercise. I understand things like that have happened before in relation to tree clearing in the area. What we want to try and achieve is to come away with a deeper understanding of the council's position on this and vice versa, they with um, our outlook and the community's outlook on the clearing as well. And hopefully we're going to end up with some kind of plan or way forward in which we can bring in uh, some kind of vegetation protections before 2025, which is when they're slated to come in. And um, I and certainly the other speakers are going to go into a bit of detail about why that's just too long to wait, basically. And we're not asking for anything extreme, but we're just asking for a balance between the needs of um, development and the community and people with somewhere to live, but also the needs of the environment as well. And 
There are plenty of councils, as you'll hear, uh, around South East Queensland who do this. Um, so we think what we're asking is quite reasonable and it's just something that we basically need to catch up with here. Um, okay, so a lot of you would have seen that petition that I started, just to give you a bit of a rundown on that and where it's at. Um, so after driving past Reese Road and just seeing the devastation there, I started this petition online on the 30th of August and it closed on the 22nd of September. So in just over three weeks, it got 6,837 signatures now. This was discussed in council on October 25th in the ordinary council meeting um, as part of a discussion around a TLPI that Councillor Cahill had put forward. Uh, and then, uh, only just recently, on the 19th of November, I got a letter um, from the, the council formally rejecting the petition because it was, uh, it was electronic, it wasn't on paper. Um, now, I'd just like to point out that the Australian Senate, the Australian House of Representatives and the Queensland Government all accept electronic petitions, so I think that's something that we need to do here uh, at some stage as well. Um, now, I have, I have been invited by the Council to redo it on paper, and this is something that uh, DDEC are doing, which I support, and is it here to be signed already? It is. It's, yeah. it's, it's here to be signed, and there's also copies you can take home with you and collect other signatures. We've got quite a lot of copies. Yes, so please do that yeah, afterwards. Just return them to the Australia Arcade so we don't lose them, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but to me, the formal rejection of the petition doesn't really matter because it served its purpose. It was a rallying point for the public and it also helped bring the attention, uh, bring the issue to the attention of the council. Um, so, so in that October meeting, the council had this motion put forward to them about bringing in a TLPI to bring in tree protection. So just to give a bit of background, TLPI stands for Temporary Local Planning Instrument. This is a statutory instrument created under the provisions of the State Planning Act 2016. And what that means is a TLPI suspends and affects the operation of any existing planning provisions that are identified within the TLPI. So where there's a conflict between existing rules and a TLPI, the TLPI will take precedence. So basically this is a method, and there are other methods that we'll hear about as well, but this is a method with which the council could use to bring in some kind of protections before 2025. Uh, and so Bill's uh, motion was defeated 6-5 um, for reasons I still don't quite understand. I think it got bogged down in some procedural discussions rather than the intent of it. So the possibility of uh, developing another TLPI is certainly something that's, uh, that we're very keen on or investigating the other methods, which is part of the reason for tonight, just finding out ways that we can get the council to do something about this before 2025. Um, we were subsequently told that TLPIs are very hard to introduce, and look, I mean, that's no doubt true, but the council have introduced a TLPI that um, actually reduces the amount of regulation on housing developments in the Greenfield areas north of Toowoomba at the moment. So just to put that in perspective, it's it's taking the brakes off and the checks and regulation, or reducing the checks and regulations on housing developments at the moment. And this is in the context of a local government area that doesn't have vegetation protection. So this can inevitably only mean more clearing is going to happen at a faster rate. So that's something that we're very concerned about. Now, the way I see it, the central problem is we have three levels of government, the, and it's the way they interact. So the state and the federal have legislation that protect some individual species, but not broader habitat unless that entire habitat type is endangered. So in the Toowoomba Regional Council area, uh, as long as you don't kill a koala or other animals that, that you know, are, are protected, you can virtually cut down whatever you want, regardless of the effect it has on their home or their habitat. And so this is the gap that the council laws need to fill. So there's plenty of high value habitat around here that may not be endangered, but is certainly worth protecting for the existing animals and also for our own aesthetic and quality of life reasons as well. Um, so what I think we need is, we need to be able to protect important stands of bush. We need to be able to protect corridors between them and also identify and develop more corridors between them. And we also need a method to protect and nominate individual trees, even if they're not part of a, a larger stand of bush, because a mature tree can serve a lot of um, purposes for wildlife, and even if it's just out in the field, it may well be a nesting site for a lot of birds, particularly the cavity nesting birds that 
rely on these trees that can take a few hundred years to actually develop the, uh, the cavities. So we need a, a method by which individual trees can be nominated and protected as well. And I understand the council has or had a, uh, a, a register of significant trees at one stage, so that could certainly um, serve as a starting point for this. Um, Sorry, well, it was like a law nine Right, okay. Well, okay, so maybe you could elaborate on that a bit, um, Bill, when you're talking. So, um, here's a quick list of councils in our area that already have tree and vegetation protection laws. And I know this from when I lived in Brisbane. Uh, we had a 60 year old jacaranda tree in our backyard, which was protected for cultural reasons. Even though it was a weed, suddenly I found out that individual trees could be protected. Um, so Brisbane City Council, Noosa Council, Sunshine Coast Regional Council, Redland City Council, Logan City and Ipswich Councils all have tree protection and vegetation protection laws that we don't. Um, now I know the planning laws are under review and I know that's a complex um, process and they will be changed in 2025, that's when it's slated to happen, but quite simply that's just too far away because of the amount of damage that can be done by then. Um, and, you know, that's to say nothing of the fact that we don't know exactly what those changes are going to be yet, and this is after the next local government election, so we don't even know what the makeup of the next council is going to be and how they're going to look on those proposed laws. Um, so, you know, a very real danger is that in 2025, you're going to have a suite of, you know, environmental protection laws, but no substantial stands of uh, environment and bush left for these laws to actually look after. The, the amount that can be lost uh, between now and then uh, is quite huge. So, um, I mean, we only have to look at the avenues to see what the future is at the moment. It is just a sea of grey roofs with small curated trees on the nature strip that serve no ecological function for the native wildlife that's left trying to survive after their habitat was taken. And, you know, that look, we believe that a balance can be struck and it's part of the maturation process, I guess, of the culture and the council here. Um, but it's going to take a lot of leadership from the council and frankly it's going to take telling developers that they have to live with smaller profits because, because they don't have the right to maximise their profits at the expense of the community or the environment. And whether it's by design or, you know, we're just... Uh, you know, haven't cottoned onto it yet, we certainly have a suite of laws that allows them to do that at the moment, and, and that just has to be changed. Um, you know, look, it's as simple as, do you want your children and grandchildren to see koalas here or black cockatoos? You know, that's, that's what it boils down to in simple terms. And I, I know the council are investigating planting a million trees, which is great, we've got nothing against that, I would love that, but that is in no way a solution to this problem, because First of all, if a mature tree is taken out, you're taking out one, two, three hundred years of growth there, so none of us are going to see um, that kind of stuff replaced in our, or you know, our descendants lifetime anytime soon. Um, and also, you know, where are you going to put those trees? Because the housing developments at the moment don't have room for trees in them. So they're so small with no backyards, and they're designed around the concept of not having any trees except these often exotic, small curated trees that you get out on the nature strips. So um, the design of these developments needs to fundamentally change as well. And this is something that's done in, in uh, councils all around South East Queensland. Developers are still developing, they're working with environmentalists and they're still making a profit. It can happen here as well. Any developer who says it can't happen here just isn't trying. So, um, you know, and the irony of this is we have all these other councils in South East Queensland with these laws, yeah, we've got the most beautiful bush out of all of them, particularly on the north side of Toowoomba, and we don't have those laws. So, um, you know, we, basically, we, we just have a beauty here that can't be easily replaced. We're surrounded by it, and if it's gone, it's gone for centuries until someone manages to rebuild it, and that will never be the same as keeping the old growth and the, the mature trees there. So. Um, th there's a number of ways forward which will be discussed um, at TLPI and Councillor Kayla has mentioned other methods as well. Um, 
So, uh, look, that's all that I had to say specifically. I, I'm going to MC the night now. Uh, did anyone have any uh, questions in relation to what I just said? Uh, Scott, I just yeah. want to say, um, you're talking about you know, other possibilities of getting counsel who doing the job of the local government should be doing. I mean, Cynic might consider what they are doing as a PR exercise because uh, in terms of their existing documentation, their green infrastructure strategy for 2000 profile, our vision was to produce a rich tapestry of green and healthy landscapes that support thriving communities and a vibrant economy, quote, where nature is valued, embedded, and enriched at every opportunity. Well, I would say the vision hasn't been really upheld. I mean, the document's been there since 2020, so um, these various planning, you know, regulations you're talking about, what about the existing strategies? I mean, is this to work the paper it's written on, basically? Yeah, that's an excellent question and I think that's something that Bill will elaborate on, but you're quite right, there's certainly uh, threads of the right messaging in uh, some of the existing bylaws and in the strategic plan which came into a little bit when we were looking at the Redwood campaign, so it's probably as much about a cultural change in the council as it is about um, any kind of legal or law changes as well, I guess, but I know we'll elaborate. Sorry if this mic keeps coming out. I don't know what's happening. Uh, any other questions before we move on? It's not a question. It's just that, you know, I love trees and I have great gardens. But I think our basic problem here is how corrupt is the outside world? Because it's not just the people who are 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 the people we're not talking about trees, we're talking about a run council and all these beautiful people are trying to do sensible things. What did you say, 2000? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, well... Oh. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, 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 And it would have been there in 2000. I mean, yeah. what game are they playing with us? They are so corrupt. How do we change the corrupt? Now. Okay, well, that, that's a very good question, and obviously that's the answer to that starts with the ballot box, I would suggest. Well, and thank you all for being here. It starts here. Yeah. Okay. All on the same. Thank you. Okay, just one last question, then we'll move on to the next speaker. Why is this Woombas a place of incredible opportunity? Um, I see a lot of problems here at the moment. We've got homelessness up 80% in the last 40 years. We've got, this is the second highest growth area in Australia, right here in Highfields, which grows about three and a half percent every year. I see a room full of people here who have uh, obviously benefited from development at some point. And I personally would love an opportunity one day to develop to help this community grow and prosper. Um, because I think it's an incredible value in this which is a lot of people and we can grow with a lot more services in there, but we've got more people voting and hop onto the census. So I guess my question is, if we, if we can't develop anywhere, how, how do we develop if we're not just going to knock down old buildings and build up them? Well, the, the answer to that is that um, there's a limit on development. Um, we're biological creatures, we can't live without the environment. The, we can't just have endless development. We certainly have space for development here and it can be done in a far more ecologically sustainable way, but if we don't, have development that's ecologically sustainable, we're just destroying ourselves. Because the, the poor, you know, there's not a single development company, there's not a single in, um, economy, there's not a single community that can exist outside of an ecosystem. That's the basis that underpins all of our existence and we have to find a way in which we can survive. But I, I, I get what you're saying and this is what we're having to find, is that balance. But you know, it doesn't matter what the percentage of um, growth is here, there's a limit to it. There's only so much space and ultimately if we don't curtail the volume of development, this is quite apart from changing the nature of the development, we don't have a future. It's as simple as that. But thank you for your input and I think what we should do now is just move on to the next Sorry. speaker. Could I please respectfully ask that um, you hand the microphone to the questions or you repeat the questions because Okay, yes, thank you for that point. Very good point. We'll hand the mic around. Uh, okay, so now Jenny's going to come back and talk about the effects of heat islands 
and I'm going to operate the PowerPoint for you. Um, not for too long. Um, I really take your question there because I see that you're a younger person as well. So you see a sea of people who are kind of probably well established. And I think it's a conversation that a lot of young people are asking with regard to where's our opportunity. And I'd probably respectfully suggest that we're not going to live in our houses forever, so we could circulate back into the city. Yeah? Um, you know, <laughs> our house will be available in a couple of years, no, 20 years. <laughs> what I'm trying to say there, and I think, look, um, you know, there's been lots of conversation. I know our councils work very hard at many levels talking about different types of development. You know, um, one of our committee members talked about having great big park space and everybody goes up. So everyone's got a great big park outside. If you've seen an Eastern, you know, a film from Eastern Europe, you would have seen that design. There's lots of different designs over in Thailand and, um, you know, if anyone's been to Woodford, you probably see some of the bamboo structures that bamboo sort of started to be a new material and actually registered as an Australian building material. So we could have numerous types of conversations about this sort of um, opportunity, you know, option. Um, uh, and I think probably what I sense from the crowd and what I know as a citizen who drives up towards Crow's Nest a lot is that um, the um, avenues which has been actually awarded um, the prize in Queensland by one judge, a judge, uh, judged to be the best um, development in Queensland. Um, <laughs> and we've, I think Scott posted that, didn't you? You posted that somewhere? Yeah. Um, yes, yes, that's right. It has been apparently um, awarded the... Um, development of the year in Queensland. So, so <laughs> anyway, so I think I think this is the kind of thing, you know, what we've got with regard to the avenues and, um, you know, subsequent developments is that little kind creek which runs through. Um, everybody probably knows that beautiful, you've got the high school, you go further up towards the high, the Pioneer Village, and that has to be one of the prettiest little areas in this whole region. Well, one side of those trees are going to go down apparently. So I think it might be time to wrap some ribbons around those and to do a bit of social protesting because um, the development behind, um, I'm not absolutely sure of my facts here, but if they bring the driveways onto that road, that'll all dry out and it won't be the same in 10 years' time. It just won't be. And so um, just, and I think that's it. This is the thing about you need a bit of a tip off. You know, this was, I heard this from somebody else who heard this from a teacher at the staff room at Harristown. And that's how we're getting our information. So. Um, I want to talk now on, um, we've been doing a bit of social research and the reason we've been doing a bit of social research is that we're social workers, um, not all of us, but a few of us in the room are, and um, what we're worried about is um, human death. So that's not a terribly nice subject for the evening, but um, we have got Toowoomba having been measured. Now the report concerned that did this, and it was 2017, so it's actually about old now, that did um, Oh, it's from, I'm sorry, it's from the RMIT Urban Mapping. So if anyone wants that reference, I've got it on a piece of paper here somewhere. Um, but um, basically they mapped all of the many, many, like probably like 137, I think it was, LGAs. And this is Toowoomba, and here's our heat urban island mapping effect. So um, you'll appreciate with concrete, and just think back, you know, 30 years ago, how much concrete there wasn't. You're covering up beautiful farms with concrete, all that lovely, you know, soil that could be underneath. Living organisms aren't living anymore. But um, this is Dolby area. Dolby was cleared of trees, you know, a long time ago. And um, there are a few trees out there. This is Warwick. Warwick's got similar. And actually, it's warmer, I think. We're not doing too bad. You know, I think we might be a bit cooler there. Um, and I think it's probably the difference between the range and Wilsonton is market. So, anyone got a suggestion as to whether that what that might be about? Trees. <laughs> and it's it is with um, and I haven't got the reference. I tried to find it this morning. I don't suppose you would know it, Andy. That um, it's it's like two or four percent, four percent difference. So, as um, former hospital social workers, we know that heat is the most deadly killer. Um, after well, actually, it is probably the most dangerous. People aren't aware of it. It sneaks up on you. It sneaks up on your medication. It sneaks up on you as an older person. And so we're going to be doing some quality research around that. And we've had some students working in that area from Deakin University, from US. Um, there's a new social work course out here at um, the University of Southern Queensland. And also we've had students from Griffith and students from UQ. They've all been working in Toowoomba, and they've all been interested in that. Because if you could flick back, Scott, to another one. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Of course. 
with regard to trauma, you'll see that it's also of Queensland, Logan and Ipswich are also vulnerable, much more vulnerable in Brisbane. So this is all about tree cover and it's pretty interesting stuff. But we're, we're going to be, you know, I think maybe we're Western fa facing, maybe I'm not quite sure all the reasons for it, but um, we're definitely going to be um, more at risk in the coming years. So just um, according to the data. That's me. I'm going to hand to... Uh, thanks, uh, Jenny. Does anyone have any questions I'd like to uh, ask Jenny in regards to the heat mapping? Nothing. Rather, rather than pass the microphone around, we'll just repeat what the question was because quite a few people have got masks in here. We don't want to share bugs via the microphone. So, uh, any questions? Yes. Do you have further data like comparing black uh, heat mapping to, say, Sydney, yes. Melbourne, so, so Fiji, Melbourne, Sydney, Melbourne, Queensland? So, further data comparing uh, South East Queensland to larger areas like Sydney? There's a whole book, it's 99 pages, and it's done by this group, RMIT, and it is called, um, so the first report was done in 2013, it was the 2020-20 vision, so it was supposed to be us getting ready for, you know, climate change back in 2013, and it was called, Where Are All the Trees? So they did some, you know, satellite imagery and so forth, um, and they had, you know, issues in the book, you know, between how to distinguish between shrubs and trees and so forth. Um, and then this uh, more recent one is where should all the trees go? So it's about planting trees. And so every local government is, is in this um, reference and I'd be really happy to circulate it. Um, and as I said, um, the group is um, the Centre for Urban Research, RMIT University. Um, so those reports are available freely. I'd like to suggest that Sydney would come up pretty good in that comparison. Uh, I was stuck there in 2020 for a long time and it really impressed me that uh, of coming back to Toowoomba, I felt I was coming back to a desert. That the development in Sydney, there's a lot of so for the young man in front, there's a heck of a lot of building going on down there. Way more than here, but it's been done way more sensitively. There's, they're leaving the wildlife corridors, they've got green spaces, they've got so much more greenery at gum trees that Tauber people, Council hates gum trees. They're dangerous, they drop branches, mm. yet Sydney is full of them. So how come Sydney can live with gum trees but Toowoomba can't? So I'd yeah. like to see a lot more comparison between other areas that have lots of commercial development, but us doing it a lot more sensibly and sustainably. And from memory, that's one. I think this might be a major theme of the night. I think I feel like a frog in what do they call it? Hot water. We've been here too long. You know, you haven't got a sense of what else is going on in the world. And um, I hear that China is absolutely thoroughly planted from people who've been there recently. Um, they were just gobsmacked, you know, so China's planting, planting, planting. Um, and what I was going to say is that in this report, they had competitions down in the New South Wales area that, as to who can get the greeners first. So there was competitions between the LGAs. Sydney's got lots, you know, so they were competing one, one against the other in terms of their, their, um, their greening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce Judy Gray from Toowoomba Koala and Wildlife Rescue. Judy's going to talk now just about koalas in the local area. And just give me one second to bring up uh, your PowerPoint. Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. It was a very old scrub wilga tree and it stood in the middle of the Reese's farm on Reese's Road. It was a few hundred years old and it's now been destroyed. So a little bit about me for people who don't know who I am. I've been a Toowoomba region resident my whole life. I grew up on a farm 
and I've lived and owned properties at Highfield since 2002. I've been a wildlife carer for 16 years. I'm a specialist species koala rehabilitator and rescuer. I've worked on a variety of local environmental projects, the most successful being two campaigns to save the Rogers Reserve from tree clearing. If you don't know the Rogers Reserve, it's the beautiful patch of trees behind the library here. You could imagine what Highfields would have looked without having that there. I received a Local Australia Day Award for my environmental community work. So I hosted two separate um, petitions for the Rogers Reserve to save it. And quite interestingly, both of those were online petitions and were received by this current council. <laughs> from the community and um, a huge reach. And since 2014, there have been a monthly proactive bush care mm -hmm. volunteer group doing um, weeding, planting, and wildlife monitoring at this reserve. It just shows what um, community um, can do. It's a really good example. So what makes Highfields unique? Highfields has some of the last examples of remnant endangered dry rainforest bushland vegetation in the Toowoomba region. Some of these areas include the Frankie Scrub, Charmaine Court Bushland Park, the Charles and Modi Rogers Bushland Reserve, the Highfields Falls and the Escarpment. It is home to many trees of significance and endangered tree and rare plant species. Now in this PowerPoint you'll see photos of me standing next to trees. It's not to show photos of myself but to show, it's like to show the sheer size of the trees um, in the images. I used to photograph them and then we used to point them and didn't show what size they were and Peter McQueen here told me you have to stand beside the tree <laughs> to show the size of it. For <laughs> local wildlife. So I'm passionate about local wildlife and the environment in our region, in the whole Toowoomba region. So you don't need to go to the Bunya Mountains. We have everything wildlife that you could ever wish to see in our own region. Each wildlife species um, has specific habitat requirements and Highfields has a diverse range of habitats supporting a great variety of wildlife. And while I talk koalas a lot, by saving their habitat, we save everything that lives underneath them. Along with our towering eucalyptus and dry rainforests, woodlands and grasslands, I believe our landscapes and wildlife are some of the region's best assets, both for locals and ecotourism. Locally, you can see a platypus. And what Jenny was talking about before, there has been many platypus sightings in Klein Creek, just down here. Bird is favourite, the Regent Bowerbird. On moving to Highfields, I saw one of these from my kitchen window and was smitten. And I've been mad about birding ever since. Did you know that Toowoomba region is home to five of the six Queensland glider species? The feather tail, sugar, squirrel, yellow-bellied and greater gliders can all be found within our local region and most in the Highfields area. The local endangered species. So it is a bit sad that these are listed, but we're pretty lucky to have them here in this region. So the greater glider. All of these photos are taken locally, by the way. The greater glider. Unfortunately, it is unknown if there are any left in the Highfields region after the removal of their last large habitat trees locally. I know of one property at Kabbalah and also at Crow's Nest where they're still managing to survive. They require enormous trees with large hollows and they live in families and they hunt for food in the area around their nest tree. Koalas, they can be found all around the region, even in the middle of Toowoomba but they have been rapidly declining over the years due to habitat loss, dog attack, disease and road trauma. And the most magnificent, powerful owl. Most people you have never heard of or even seen this beautiful bird of prey. It's an extremely large owl and they are vulnerable species. In the last two years, they have nested locally at Williams Park successfully. Williams Park is just down like below um, the Highfields High School on Klein Creek. They have also nested in Highfields Falls at the past. These birds cover and require a large range of area to hunt for native food and extremely large trees with hollows to survive. They're pretty spectacular. And many of you who follow the Powerful Owl Project that have featured our local Highfields Powerful Owls many times. Oh, koalas, it's my go-to. So they are now listed as an endangered species the koala itself is protected, but however, their habitat is not. So how is this possible for this species to survive? Just because an area is mapped as koala habitat or remnant vegetation, it does not guarantee its protection. 
Many people do not understand this or fathom how this could be possible. After all, what is the point of mapping if not to protect and educate? We will continue to see koalas in strife like this until there is change. So that brings me to trees and the reason that most of you are here tonight. I'm going to touch on a couple of the mass tree clearing projects in our region over the years that I've had the displeasure of witnessing. This is only a few of the many that come to mind. Please note that I'm not anti-development. I understand the need for housing and community growth, but I'm encouraging of development that works with the existing environment and assesses and considers the environmental impacts it can cause and considers compromises for wildlife and region aesthetics. Complete clear felling of old growth habitat should be a thing of the past. Amen. And we should And we should look at retaining trees of significance, trees with hollows and wildlife corridors. The avenues, the Cronin Road Verge. This was once listed as an endangered ecosystem. This was downgraded for the development of the new estate and completely removed. A koala was seen and photographed in this road verge at the time of the clearing. Some of these trees could have been retained and would have complemented the new estate with existing properties on the northern side of the road and their existing trees. Happy Valley Road in Kabbalah. While areas of environment protection were stipulated to be retained in Council's development approval, which was very good of them, many enormous old growth trees were illegally removed over the Easter weekend that year. That is so no one could check on it. It completely changed the landscape forever, creating much upset in the region. Brazier's bushland at Clinton. Possibly the worst example of remnant vegetation clearing that our region will ever see. Hundreds of acres of the most pristine, untouched, endangered remnant vegetation was cleared under the self-accessible land clearing laws by a property owner over nine months. 20 environmental laws were broken. The clearing continued despite best efforts and an outcry from the local community. This was the last local area known for the Greater Glider. <coughs> We are a Glen Estate. This is the recent one. So more old growth trees were recently cleared on this property, which had previously been cleared for agriculture generations ago. Terrified a terrified koala was rescued from this site. It was the most distressing thing to see crying in the trees while everything was knocked around, knocked down around it. Another was found dead, hit by a car on the Glen Road in the week following the clearing. The Reese Road Estate. This needs no introduction and is the main reason that you're all here tonight. Despite best efforts by local residents back in 2017, a petition meetings and much public press about the upcoming development application were unsuccessful in changing council's mind about retention of road verge trees of significance, creating parks and a planned change of the development outlay for the driveways to not come off Reese's Road. This could have seen the Reese Road Verge trees um, saved. Instead, this is what we have now. So recent public pressure and online campaign has had a massive reach. Koala experts from the RSPCA in Brisbane told me they received panicked calls about this clearing from people desperate, wanting someone to help to stop it and unsure what they could do and who they could contact. Council rejected this recent campaign and all suggestions for increased tree protection laws and voted against a halt on tree clearing before the new planning scheme begins discussion in 2023. A lot of damage can be done in the environment during these seven months. Just look at what's happened in a matter of days. <coughs> so what allows this to happen? Basically, it's weak environmental laws. Downgrading of environmental protection and the self-accessible land clearing options many years ago. While talking about laws is extremely boring, without upgrading of environmental protection, we'll continue to see destruction like this that we have in recent months. In 2015, Toowoomba was listed on the WWF map. Mm. Imagine. 
Imagine what we would be now. So we've recently seen some new legislation. In um, Two years ago, the koala draft strategy was brought in by the Queensland Government to address the decline in koala population densities in South East Queensland. Lots of new terms and mapping were introduced, including, including, including KPA, Koala Priority Area. Unfortunately, hardly any of our region is included in this vital mapping and protection area, despite the large amount of koala. The core koala habitat for Highfield. This is a brand new map. It does not, does not mean that these areas, however, are protected. But it will help assist council in development applications. It's a bit hard to see here, but you can look at this online. Um, this is the Rogers Reserve just behind us here. So what can, so what can council do? The koala draft strategy encourages local government to participate in koala mapping, habitat protection and restoration. This is a choice that TRC could make and lead by example and create their own positive projects. Brisbane City Council has chosen to do a variety of projects and preserve the koala, their biggest tourism asset, um, by habitat and bushland acquisition project, fauna infrastructure, driver awareness measures, Habitat enhancement and vegetation management, wildlife movement solutions, habitat poles, escape poles, culvert ledges, and more. Wildlife awareness <coughs> monitors, assisting and assisting numerous research projects. Sorry about this slide. Sorry. Um, so TRC um, really wouldn't need to do very much to create positive change and increase the public approval. They can choose. Trees of significance and road birch trees, um, like what has been done in Toowoomba in many old streets. They can help um, create initiatives and projects to protect koala habitat. Um, look, sorry guys, obviously the battery's dying in this radio mic, so we might just take a break for a couple of minutes while we try and get them replaced. Okay? I have asked for it to be fixed. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, um, yes, up the back. Um, I've got to go, uh, it's, it's been great, but I'd just like to make two comments, observations. I've been here 23 years. With regards to the Reese Road development, I think it is a fault of council to not reprimand developers because the public notice, and I believe in law, there are two public notices that have to be on two roads. Um, there was no public notice on Reese Road, which is the main thoroughfare. One of the public notices was on the road up to the sports grounds, and the other was on a road above it going down towards the creek. We do not drive up and down those roads, so therefore we had no idea that there was a public notice about proposed development, a sneaky way for the developer to tick the box and council accept it. Dale's got to change. <laughs> and the other thing is, I really would like to understand, and I know the answer will not be forthcoming, but I've been told that there is a remuneration reward for the increased amount of rate payers on a growth percentage to councillors wow. at wow. various wow. levels. Wow. And if it's wrong, I apologise for the councillors present, but I've been told on good authority that there is some sort of reward remuneration for the growth of rate payers. And the other thing is, why do we allow 420 square metre allotments which does adversely impact with the current tree population? Why, you know, Pie Fields of old 2,000, 4,000 square metre allotments well, I guess, look, that, that's something that uh, that's partly what tonight is about. So thanks for your input. Now, um, we'll, we'll, we'll take you back up, but I, 
I would just like to say too, we have a number of councillors here and I'd like to thank you for coming. It's shown that you care and it's also shown some courage as well because you're coughing up a bit of flack. And I'd just also like to caution everyone, if, if you're making statements about corruption or remuneration or things like that, okay, um, this is probably not the venue to be doing that. If you have serious concerns, take them to the appropriate legal avenues. Um, and I'd certainly like to give the Deputy Mayor an opportunity to respond at the end of the night if you'd like to, Jeff. Totally up to you. Um, so, yeah, sorry about the mic dropping out. So, uh, thanks, Judy. Judy, could you repeat what Council could be doing? Because we couldn't hear it. Okay, yeah, so um, I'll just go over that again. So, the Brisbane City Council has chosen to do a variety of projects because of this draft koala strategy to preserve the koala. They realise it is their biggest tourism asset. Um, these are a choice and not something that they have been forced to do by the state government. Things that Brisbane has been doing include habitat and bushland acquisition projects, fauna infrastructure, driver awareness measures, habitat enhancement and vegetation management, wildlife movement solutions. That allows koalas to move around safely in the different areas. Yeah. Habitat poles, escape poles, culvert ledges and more. Wildlife awareness monitors and assisting numerous research projects. So I believe that um, TRC wouldn't need to do very much to create positive change and increase their public approval. They can choose to make it a priority to retain trees of significance and road merged trees. They can create other initiatives and projects to protect koala habitat and also encourage um, ecotourism in Toowoomba and protect trees of significance like they have in various old areas of Toowoomba where the roads go around those old trees. Many of you will have seen those. So what um, yeah, can council do? about the new draft strategy. So they have announced this week that they're going to be searching for funding to do more of the koala mapping and that they will support the new draft screens, um, draft scheme. So that's very, very positive. Okay, yes. So I don't want this talk to be um, about, yes, about um, giving council a hard time because that's really not going to get us anywhere. Um, and that's not really my view. I just want to look at encouraging and inspiring our region's voice to do more to protect and promote our environmental assets and support those members of the community who are doing so and being proactive. So these are positive projects that I have witnessed myself for koalas in our region and I really think that they're worth mentioning. And these are all because of Toowoomba Regional Council. But firstly, the koala fodder plantation for koala rehabilitators like myself at Kubi Dam. This was established in 2002 and I have been allowed continued access to this facility, even during the COVID lockdowns. It was vital for my use after the bushfires and having six koalas in full-time care that needed feeding every day for almost a year. I'd love it to be a bit bigger, but it's been fantastic that it's been retained and it's very, very valuable for wildlife carers in our area. The reinstatement of the Land for Wildlife program in 2022. This is a free, non-binding program that encourages and insists, um, assists landholders to protect and restore habitat for wildlife on their properties. It is a rewarding and informative program for landowners and I encourage anyone with acreage to consider joining this program. It's absolutely fantastic. The installation of koala awareness signs. So at our request, um, oh, um, there has been three areas in the region where the council has installed permanent koala awareness signs. They are on Clinton School Road, Moringan Dam Road, where there are two lots of signs, and Glengar Road in Toowoomba. This is very, very valuable for um, driver awareness, and yeah, we're very appreciative to have this permanent signage. So the most significant thing that has really helped me and helped our region was Toowoomba Regional Council's assistance, providing a cherry picker and operators during the Peachy Hampton bushfires for koala rescue. would not have been able to save so many burnt koalas without this vital assistance. I can't speak highly enough of the council machine operators and the workers 
who went above and beyond to help us rescue wildlife um, and koalas with the, helping the volunteers over numerous weeks. It wasn't a short time, it was a very long time and they were there every day from whether it's 4.30 in the morning till late at night. They helped us and they were absolutely fantastic. So what can you do? So this is all a community thing. You need to keep up to date with development applications in your region. Educate yourself on habitat mapping and laws. Retain vegetation and wildlife corridors on your own property. Volunteer with local environment groups or attend meetings. Keep council accountable and encourage them with positive environmental projects and be a voice for your region. You can lobby the state government for increased koala priority area mapping. Speak to your local member and inquire about what they are doing to support habitat um, protection. Small projects can make a huge difference. And something that Jenny mentioned as well is lodging local wildlife sightings on the iNaturalist app. Also, very soon, the Queensland Government, before the end of the year, is launching their own um, koala mapping app, and this will be very vital to add records yourself straight to the government database. If you want your grandchildren to be able to see a koala in the wild and not just in the zoo, we all need to do our part. After all, what do we want? Tall timbers or fallen timbers? Thank you. Thank you very much you for a very important speech. Um, look, I, I think we might just change the uh, structure a little bit because we want to finish by 8 o'clock. And uh, we might just hold all the presents off till the end, okay? So uh, Peter McQueen is going to talk now on plants, and then uh, Bill Cahill. Uh, and then uh, if any of the councillors present here would like to respond, you're quite welcome to as well, then we'll just throw it open for public discussion and questions. So thank you, Peter. Hi, thank you very much, Peter. Um, engaging people and I think that's really what this whole whole event is, is about. It's about having that conversation and straight, straightening out a few, a few things. Um, we know why we're here tonight. We're here for trees and we're seeking an end to destruction for urban, develop, urban development. We, we want to preserve the natural environment and make provision for innovative, environmentally responsible housing that addresses real people's needs. Can you put the mic to your mouth? Thank you. Point it at your mouth. You're very good at monitoring it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to quote John, John Muir, we're, we're here not, not with blind opposition to progress, but with opposition to blind progress. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're in a climate and extinction crisis. Um, we're feeling the impacts of it, of it here with increased temperatures, um, more extreme weather patterns, uh, the creeping loss of plants and animal species, and just simply the effects of extraordinary weather in other areas, that, the, the flow on effect there, because we're all part of the system. When we see more clearing for development, we're wounded. It hurts, doesn't it? We, we feel the loss, and our values are compromised. It's what we care about, isn't it? We're upset by seeing the loss of landscapes we're familiar with because they hold memories. It's real places. And help us find meaning in the world and feel lost because we relate to other organisms. We're sharing our place in the world for them. And we feel wounded because we know that that sharing relationship is good for us. Some people may, re may regard development around us as the inevitable march of progress and would view our emotions as self-indulgence, but it's a whole lot more than that. Trees support our existence. They created the oxygen rich air that we breathe. We, do we continue to see the destruction of natural environments and proliferation of urban sprawl that has brought us to this point. Historically, across this region here and across the whole area, settlements were cleared for farming. Pretty understandable. But some patches of forest were left, it was all on a smaller scale, and some matured trees were retained. Since then, towns have grown, 
and it's all from roadsides that provide the last remnants of um, habitat. And they can be amazing little islands of biodiversity. You know, they, they mature trees there, they're precious. In rural areas with the decline of small, small farming and that more intense land use, especially around towns, um, less farming pressure on the landscape has, le has led to more remnant vegetation growing across the area. These areas of remnant and re regenerating trees are a precious resource for the maintenance of local ecosystems. They're functioning habitat for wildlife, seed banks for future growth, and when undisturbed, they can regenerate to a high degree of biodiversity. They do create the landscape we, we enjoy. They mitigate heat, cold, wind, they slow down runoff, they increase infiltration. They, they're the basis of our hydrological cycle. They're important and they warrant protection. Permitted land clearing in the region is based on state vegetation maps, which derive from satellite images. They're on a pretty big scale. And they don't have local observation to, to accompany them. Consequently, for what might be small but significant areas of remnant vegetation are not recognised. And this is the major shortcoming of, of this mapping. This is how we've ended up with the clearing that's happened locally three months ago, locally over the past years, whatever's pending as, as it comes up. It can be different. If we had regionally derived vegetation maps and a regional environmental policy, we may have been able to save these beautiful trees. As it is, on privately owned land, there is pretty much no protection for trees within a house footprint or for state mapped Category X land, which includes a lot of our regenerating vegetation. And there is no protection if the terms of a permit are not uh, enforced. It's imperative that the council inventory these outposts of life and protect them. Because under state legislation, perfectly legal land clearing is destroying the place we call home. But, you know, it's happening. It's wide areas on the map. Toowoomba region is a, is a good place to live. We've got a com pretty comfortable climate at the moment. Trees for the moment, diversity of wildlife, proximity to natural areas, proximity to workplaces and services and so on. And these are important to us. Council promotes these values and the image of the region is built on them. In, in 2020, the council introduced the, the Green IS. To, to, and I quote, to position the Toowoomba region as a leader in green infrastructure, planning and delivery. <laughs> its aim is to officially recognise the value of our environment and prioritise it in regional planning decisions. Since then, there have been many missed opportunities to protect trees and enhance our regional environment. It takes time, I know, but it doesn't take long to knock trees down. With almost 100 towns and localities across the region, the, per the peripheries of many are sooner or later going to be under similar pressure. And the, the intent of the Green IS, it's really good. It's good. It's good. It does all sorts of, it says, what it says in there is really good. Um, It's, but its application requires policies. It's there, but it's going to grow some teeth. We need policy to protect existing vegetation, development in policies that incorporate existing vegetation to urban areas. And it's worth noting that the Green IS repeated states Council's intention to work collaboratively with, with the community. That's what we're doing tonight. Offsetting vegetation loss by replanting on site or elsewhere does not replace what's lost. And certainly, Kenny um, has mentioned that. 
Quantum clearing must cease. Council needs to take an active role in saving natural areas. Existing vegetation must be mapped and a priority in our development application process. Not something, as it has been in the current plan, something of an afterthought to be checked off at the end. It needs to be treasured now, forever, and for future generations. There is no more decision. I'm more decisive. <laughs> this is Julie here. This is my, this is, this, behind every man there's a splendid woman, as everyone knows. <laughs> There is no more decisive, I've got it right now, wait uh, for a landscape than to be turned into a suburb. Um, clearing, compaction, excavation, roofs, hard surfaces, increased runoff, increased heat, as Jenny was talking about. The result is decimation of biological complexity. And might not even be a very nice place to live. <laughs> Let us reflect, this country has had people living on it for tens of thousands of years. And in that time, the landscapes have been certainly modified, but they didn't lose their core ability to provide clean water, food, shelter for its inhabitants. This con continued because First Nations people understood country. Now is the time for us to similarly consider country. We don't get living in Australia. We need to, it's the time to consider country in the context of increased demands from population, a changing climate. It's a whole different world, but we need to understand it. It requires approaches to land use and management that do challenge the practices of the last century and a half. As humans, we know what is intrinsically good for us, but in order to participate in society, we're daily asked to surrender that awareness, that knowing. We are asked to accept what is rapidly becoming a declining standard of living, declining health and well-being, and it really isn't our only option. We need housing. Yes, yeah, there's a housing crisis, absolutely. But more six or eight hundred square metre blocks aren't the solution. We need more creative and efficient housing and land use solutions. <laughs> With considered design, housing developments can provide a diversity of housing options for people while maintaining existing trees and intact ecological <laughs> systems that support all life. And certainly, you know, there was a report yesterday what do young people care about? Really, we're all thinking tonight for young people, aren't we? Young people care about housing, cost of housing, uh, as we've just heard. Cost of housing and the environment. And we've got to tie the two together in order to make the world livable. Prescribed planting of street trees does enhance the development, but it doesn't replace the habitat diversity and complexity that is lost in the clearing of natural areas. Now, imagine if housing met the needs of everyone in the community. Imagine if our communities were built to sustain biodiversity and the productivity and well-being of people. Let's make it our bold ambition for the Wumpere. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Um, any questions we'll save till afterwards. Now, uh, Councillor Bill Cale is going to speak now. I, just as a uh, point of clarification, I'd just like to point out, Bill is here in his role as a councillor and obviously as a concerned citizen. Um, Bill's name on our flyer at the start uh, was, I guess, a protocol error on our part. We were just advertising him as a speaker. He's not been involved in the organisation of this event and he's certainly yeah. speaking his own mind here. He's not. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? Your presence here does not imply that you endorse everything that we've been saying. So uh, Bill's certainly going to speak his own mind now, so thank you. Um, first, 
firstly, thank you so much for the invite. Um, uh, councillors get invited to all sorts of forums and events um, and talk on all sorts of subjects. Um, each one of us councillors get uh, numerous invites. But um, firstly, um, can I to um, pay my respects to the traditional custodians on the land in which we meet? Um, and that's really important. I thank you so much, Peter, for talking about connection, uh, connection to country. I'm actually start uh, writing a piece around that in my master's, uh, my research master's thesis around connection and understanding uh, and how we build awareness and levels of that awareness. Uh, and that's quite frankly one of the main reasons why I'm here tonight. Um, I. I, I want to stress, these are my personal thoughts. I want to uh, bring these personal thoughts at the appropriate time to council for discussion as we, we embark on this journey uh, in formulation of the new planning scheme and specifically around environmental matters. Um, but I, out of respect for my colleagues here tonight, I feel as though I need to speak about this and it's not related to what I've I'm here to speak about, but I do want to address the issue of remuneration. And I, and I feel to, on behalf of my colleagues, um, that council, councillors' uh, remuneration is determined by a separate remuneration tribunal of which we have no dealings with or no input to. So it's an independent body, um, totally separate from local government. Um, there are banding or ratings that council is given upon its size, yes, but it's also dependent upon the range of functionality, functions and services, uh, the diversity of that, and it's also dependent on the diverse area or geographical area. And may I remind people, we were one of the uh, few, or if not probably the highest amount of amalgamated councils into one at amalgamation. So I just really want to clarify that. Um, and I am definitely not here uh, because of the pay. <laughs> I can assure you. Um, if you've extrapolated out to an hourly rate, um, I reckon I could probably do else, better elsewhere. And I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I want to bring a balance to that. And I, want, I, I respect my colleagues for coming here tonight and listening to the community. So, uh, and, I, and I want to also thank my family. I want to thank my wife Kim, my daughter Naomi, my son-in-law Bill, he's a good bloke because his name's Bill, um, and my two grandchildren who are here, two of our four grandchildren, Leo and Violet. Thank you for coming and supporting me. So without any, thought, I, Look, the format of what I want to cover, and I'll cover it as quickly as possible, because it's been a long night. One, I want to talk in general terms. I, don't want to be, I won't be answering questions specifically about Rees Road, um, because um, there's been comments in, in public meetings, um, and I have to be careful about potential conflict. Right? So um, I will talk in general terms. Um, two, I want to talk about what others are doing in this space. And I've done a bit of digging and delving myself, a little bit of research, very preliminary, and there's a lot more out there. And three, I want to talk about an idea, not a solution, an idea I want to put on the table around how we treat high water roads and canopy that exists in those road reserves and there's a natural road network. And four, I want to talk about the green infrastructure strategy. So firstly, who owns the trees? None of us. We all own, we are all collective stewards of those trees. Um, we're custodians. Uh, by the way, the higher order around uh, environment, the hierarchy of order is one, preservation, two, mitigation, and three, the least of all desired is offsets. So planting trees, yeah, we can do that, but it's the least desirable outcome. I just want to be clear about that. So, um, in broad terms, it's about sustainability. And if we know what sustainability, the broad brush is triple bottom line. Environment, economic, social. 
And if any one of those, if the environment's the poor cousin, I think speakers before me have more than adequately articulated the fact that we will not survive into the future. So we have to have a balanced three-legged stool. Or if you want to put another layer on that, around stewardship and custodian and management, we go quadruple bottom line, we're responsible for the governance of that. And whilst I'm a community leader and my colleagues collectively here, it is everyone, we all have to have skin in the game. Yeah. All of us. Doesn't matter what sector we're from. So, um, I want to talk briefly and very briefly. I've just handpicked a few things out of other council, what they're doing in this space. And I want to pose a question to you right up front. If others are doing it, why can't we? Okay, Sunshine, Care, uh, Sunshine Coast. And I'm not a planner, I stress that, and I stand to be corrected on any of this. We're very open to being corrected. Um, and just while I think about it, going back to the young gentleman's comments here, we need to come from a sustainability position about how we balance. Um, and in those three legs of that stool are very important. So, uh, Sunshine Coast, tree clearing uh, in, on private property. It's considered a develop, uh, development or it's part of operational works approval regulated by the planning scheme. We don't have that. So, so it's a accessible activity, which means they have a tree protection policy. Um, and it's an offence to remove those trees if they meet that protected criteria. Um, vegetation on road reserves, approval to clear under council laws, uh, uh, local laws and permits are required. So uh, if I go to Noosa, trees on public land, uh, if it's unavoidable to clear those trees on um, public land, council then goes about an offset program. So to my knowledge, we don't have that. Um, tree interference uh, is managed under the local laws for Noosa. On private land planning, uh, tree clearing, the planning scheme requires a permit to remove um, any vegetation and it's, there's an application form and process they go through. This is, and all of these councils are, have clearly set out tables or schedules as part of the development assessment process. Now I'm not just talking about a subdivision, I'm talking about tree removal as being a development assessment. Right? And, and there are an exemption table for the vegetation that doesn't fall under that uh, uh, protected uh, range. And I might add that native species is particularly important as I've looked across these councils. Um, so um, if I go to uh, Logan, protected vegetation, biodiversity areas uh, overlay in the planning scheme. It requires an operational works application at the time a development happens. It's not uh, approved by council before there is an application um, under an operational works. That's a mechanism that the developer has to supply to council. That piece of uh, regulation is in place to ensure that those, there is a clear set out plan about what will and won't go. Um, there's categories for protected vegetation. They call it primary, which is native vegetation. Secondary, and here, this is not new stuff. This has been around for a long time. Secondary uh, is anything above four metres, a trunk circumference of 31.5 centimetres or greater, measured at 1.3 metres from the ground. Exemptions apply for fire and such things like that. But here's some real practical uh, um, examples I want to put on the table at the appropriate time for discussion with council. Um, Redlands talks about protection of trees on private land, the planning scheme. It's, it's administered by the planning scheme and or by local laws. Sensitive areas where vegetation is not to be removed until 
the building approval is received. Now that's even beyond an operational works. That's beyond the development application stage. That's a detailed plan of where and what the building looks like, where it'll be situated, and what parts of vegetation may have to be removed. So that's the extent they look at in sensitive areas. Um, there's a, a vegetation protection order that they have. For time, I, I won't go into that, but there's some, um, some quite straightforward things that we can look at there. In Ipswich, an application can be made for a VPO, a vegetation protection order, and that is with or without the consent of the landowner. However, if it's without consent of the landowner, there has to be reasons clearly articulated and stated on that application for, for council to even consider it. Um, there's tables to how they clearly set out examples of how you might be able to, what you can apply for, or what falls under the category of um, protected vegetation and how that vegetation protect, protection order is set out and they have clear guidance for members of the public, um, developers, for uh, different groups to actually make application to council. And if there's an immediate threat, they have an avenue under that v VPO to call council uh, about something that's under immediate threat. And in the Gold Coast, they have an operational works budget. Do you see a recurring theme here? Um, operational works for vegetation clearing. There's an exemption on tables of assessment for a on tables of assessment. In other words, if it's under four metres, it's not a native species or this, or, you know, there's a range of things. And these are the sorts of things I want to put on the table for, for our council to talk about what's appropriate for our area, okay? Uh, this is not this is not new stuff. Uh, they they also have uh, above four metres high, a forty centimetre uh, trunk at one point three metres above the ground. And here, you know, little old Somerset, our neighbour, real clear. They say vegetation clearing is an accessible development. There are exemptions, and there are constrained areas and they unpack that in the policy. And if I can read it as a lay person, I encourage all of you to read it um, because this is a, a, about a level of awareness uh, so that we're having a conversation that is heading in, a, in the same direction. We really need, this is a very sensitive and very real and can be emotive uh, topic. Um, and I'll be, I've uh, articulated some of my reason around why I'm passionate about it. And it's because um, my connection to the country, and I identify as an Aboriginal person. Um, and uh, I see a few surprise looks because I look white, but people don't know my story. Um, I'm, a, I'm an Awabical man that has um, been on a journey for some time now, and I clearly understand my family heritage. And, uh, um, and it's a very rare opportunity for Aboriginal people to actually have a clear genealogy and, and uh, family track um, to, to look back on, because there's so many of us that don't. So, sorry for digressing there. Um, my idea that I want to put on the, council, uh, on, the, on the table for council to consider it, and, you know, and it's not, it's not it's not an out there concept, and I understand there are other areas that are, are viewing this to a degree. But it's simply around um, the network of roads that we have. And some of these are old corridors, old road corridors with established vegetation. So here's my thought or idea, and I stress that. I'm not looking at a solution, I'm saying I want to discuss this with the technical experts and my colleagues. Um, we have a road easement. We have mature vegetation on the side. I'm a frustrated teacher, not really, but I'd love to have a whiteboard and a pen to draw it for you because I've sort of got to get the message across. So uh, road, vegetation, boundary fence, private property. So if we said, and this is an idea, to the developer, if we've all got skin in the game, 
But what if you made a contribution along that high order road, that connector road, of a strip of land so that we could make it a meaningful easement? We could preserve the vegetation. We have greater property setbacks on those higher order roads, right? So we don't worry about trees falling on houses. Those houses, the front of the house addresses the road and there's a rear laneway where they can get into their double garage or whatever that is. The garbage truck can collect um, waste from a rear laneway. There's not a back fence where lawn clippings go over onto um, the main road. The house faces it. And um, what do you think that would do for amenity? And I use the word amenity because the planning courts use biodiversity and conservation and roll you every time because they say there's no biodiversity value in a strip of mature trees. It's disconnected from. But amenity, this man here talked about the shade, cooling effect, um, visual, um, the health benefits of having trees are proven time and time again. It's amenity. And that word in a planning court holds weight. Amenity. I want you to remember that. So then we say, well, okay, Mr. Developer, if we've got skin in the game, if we want to the environment to be preserved, well, then how can we work out, perhaps, perhaps, I don't know, but I'm going to ask these questions through an infrastructure agreement. If we put a value on that vegetation like other councils have, um, could we come to an arrangement under an infrastructure agreement where we will uh, reimburse you for you preserving or containing those trees? Number one, preservation. Number two, mitigation. Number three, offset. But where possible, if you uh, contain or remain or keep that corridor of trees, where we can over the next 60 years plan and connect it to other corridors. Remember, some of these major road easements in the developing area, in the, in the urban footprint and the fringe of that urban footprint is very real and it's not just here in Whitecaps. It's all over the place around major population. So that's an idea I want to float. And I stress it's an idea and I'm open to correction on that. But I do want to unpack that and I've already begun to unpack with some of the, uh, men, uh, the men and women in the development sector and have the conversation um, over a glass of wine or a, you know, whatever. Um, I want to talk to those guys because it's important and all of us need to come together and have a conversation about how we make a difference. Because we can't expect one sector to do the heavy lifting. It's all of our responsibility. Um, so that's an idea. And finally, um, green infrastructure strategy. Um, look, I, for, for time, I won't go into a lot of detail, but on page five of this document, it talks about um, actions and implementation. It talks about policy and delivery tools to set direction and drive decisions. That's putting policy under this strategic document. I must add that this document um, is very strategic. And if you look at that diagram in there, it sits alongside the corporate plan and it's measurable or answerable to the corporate plan. That's our roadmap and there are key performance indicators against that. So, you know, I'm suggesting here that um, uh, I want to raise this as a priority for Council to consider between now and 2025 of what we're prepared to invest into um, investigating and getting better outcomes. So it talks about demonstration projects, it talks about advocacy and education to show leadership. Um, and demonstration projects, perhaps a higher order road network work in the future could be a demonstration project of how we've saved trees along the side of the road instead of flattening them. And the other thing I must mention with that is how we restrict access to that road in, in order to mitigate the need for widening that road because of the amount of entries and exits onto it. And how do we get infrastructure 
down on the inside of that vegetation instead of having to uh, use the excuse that we need to get infrastructure where the trees are. So, I don't know, I'm, I'm a pretty basic sort of a lay, a lay person, I stress. On page uh, six, purpose and how to use it. It talks about the sense of direction, support a step change, Toowoomba region, uh, so, uh, so Toowoomba region that it becomes a, a business as usual in the near future. We're not talking about the next 20 years. This document says it here. Um, it also says the development of meaningful, meaningful objective base based on objectives, based on a strong understanding of Toowoomba uh, existing green infrastructure. Um, so there's a body of work there for us to do. Uh, green infrastructure occurs both on private and public. And I stress, we're going through a mapping exercise around matters of local environmental significance, MLES, you'll hear it, and look out for it. But I'm suggesting that um, uh, there is valuable vegetation outside of MLES areas. Okay. And there are clear parameters of how other councils have measured that. And, and this strategy talks about monetizing that, um, putting a value on it. On page eight, it talks about who will be responsible. Oh no, oh, yeah, who will be responsible? strategic policy. It sits above operational policies. It sits above a lot of other working policies. This is a strategic policy. So my question is, how are we going to put wheels underneath this? Right. Who is responsible? Implementation of the strategy will require strong leadership by council and an ongoing collaboration to ensure the protection and delivery of green infrastructure becomes business as usual across the Toronto region. While Council will lead the delivery of this strategy and ongoing monitoring of its success, the broader community will play an important role as custodians of many of the green infrastructure elements across the region. Um, page 23 talks about how we will achieve it. And I'm nearly done, Willis. I need four minutes here. There it is. Oh yeah. So it talks about who will achieve it, and then it talks about demonstration projects, policy, and delivery tools, skills, and knowledge. It talks about um, in demonstration projects, green infrastructure solutions to become tailored to suit local conditions. I'm not talking about a one size fits all. We have to treat this um, with some seriousness about what is appropriate. Policy and delivery to, delivery tools. It talks about setting clear direction and requirements in policy and plans and standards is important to generate consistency. Talks about in skills and knowledge, equipping our council with the right skills and resources to allow us to act as a leader. In advocacy and education, it talks about building awareness and ability for community to be involved. I'd just like to ask why are you saying this? We know it needs doing. Why haven't you done it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I hope I hope you've picked up enough um, from uh, my my topic around what others are doing. Yes. And my question is, why can't we do this? Yes. Some of this why stuff? Why and so this is where this is where I'm here as an individual. Yes. I can't say we are doing this. But this is where the conversation and part of the reason for my motion that I raised the other uh, uh, month in council was to bring some awareness to the broader community, not just in briefing sessions. We're just getting anxious that we're not going to hear the other speakers. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, 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 um, the other thing is uh, there's some specifics on how this will happen in the tables. So, um, just to, to wrap up, and I've, I've had some conversation with uh, different people around this, and um, our position, in broad, broadly speaking, um, 
we rely on state overlays. We do have some, but it comes back to a subjective view of a value judgment. And we are lacking, in my view, policy. And this is why I'm talking about this strategic document sets it out. So we, we need to start on the process of putting wheels on this document with supporting policy like other councils have. So, um, and outside of a development, we really have nothing but state and federal legislation around preservation of trees, and we see the shortcomings with that. So I'm suggesting. I can't say the date. No, no. I actually, I can, I can at the at, in the meeting in early. Uh, People can't hear you. Look, the question was, you know, can we put a date on? No, I can't. I'm one councillor. But, but I can say that we are meeting around environmental matters early in the new year to talk about what sort of policies we want to consider. So that's why I'm putting it out in front of you. And I, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence here. But I want to actually make you aware and point this back to us as council. You've already said it. Now let's do it. Like others. Thank you. I'll hand back to Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Bill, for sharing your perspective there. I, I think the short answer is the council surely by now have got the message that the community sentiment is in favour of actually doing these things. It looks like there's a lot of triggers uh, and strategic planning already in place, whether or not a TLPI is required is another question. Uh, it may not well be, but um, I, there are other councillors here. I know we're running out of time and it, it hurts to sit down for two hours. So, would anyone like to speak? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank, thanks very much, Scott. Thanks, everyone. Look, what this has demonstrated to councillors here, and I can. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, Jeff McDonald is my name, yeah, Deputy Mayor representing councillors here and, and obviously the community. But what tonight has clearly demonstrated is exactly what we've been hearing since the petition came into council and the technicalities around it. I can rest, you can be rest assured the council took on that petition as if it was a petition, okay? So just put that out there. Uh, but what I will say to you is that we are committed as a council and we've proven that over time by way of purchasing escarpment land to preserve it, by building a sports park which is arguably the best in regional Australia and preserved a parkland as part of that. We've, we've uh, purchased uh, property across the road here preserving parkland as part of that. So we are demonstrating the things that, that we're listening to, okay? The concern to us and the concern of the community is quite clear and it's around timing. It's around timing to make sure that we do what we can in policy to protect the things that are important to us as a community. And everyone agrees in this room, without a shadow of a doubt, the preservation of our environment is so critical, particularly for the young lady down there that was holding a koala. This is so very important for us. We, no one disagrees with that. What we need to do now is work out and Councillor Carl, or Bill, sorry, Bill, tonight, has mentioned and, and did a great job mentioning that early in the new year we're coming together as a council, as we already have, on the environmental significance. Um, so what we can do is get some media uh, soon after that, and Councillor Megan O'Hara Sullivan is the chair of that with Councillor Bill's portfolio. I'm sure we can work out a strategy where we can come together as a community and give you an update of where we're at. But we can't commit to that as a date tonight, okay? And we won't, because we'll end up in jail, all right? That's as simple as that. I don't think anyone wants to do that. Um, but what we can do is make sure that you are, you're clearly understood and heard. That's why we have six councillors here tonight. So I can, you, I can guarantee you that you have been. It's on YouTube as well. Judy, great presentation. Thank you for the bouquets. And we will pass those on to the operational team. We don't get too many bouquets. There haven't been too many thrown around tonight, so we thank you for that. But we, we will, we've, we've taken all on board. It's on tape, and our other colleagues will see that as well, okay? Um, so we'll definitely do it. But you've been heard. And thank you for the community. Tonight's the 1st of December and you're all out here. It shows the commitment. So we, we sincerely thank you for doing that. Um, so in summary, councillors, thank you. I think we've got enough time to listen to a few more questions. Thank you to Scott. Um, thank you to all of you who have spoken. It's been fantastic. I do appreciate it. 
But let's not forget, let's not forget that unintended consequences have caused the problem that we're talking about, okay? Unintended consequences can also cause other problems if we don't assess it and do it properly and balance everything. And that is the challenge for elected representatives to do that. So that's a challenge for us, it's a challenge for the community. We're committed to do that, okay? To do the best we possibly can. We are committed, we've heard you tonight, we thank you very much and, and uh, wish you all a very happy Christmas. Uh, Jay, could I clarify, were you speaking on behalf of council tonight or on behalf of yourself? Thanks, uh, Kim, I was talking on behalf of council tonight. Okay. I was introduced as the deputy mayor, so it's important that uh, we Jay, clarify that. How, how long does it take to get policy into place? A very good question. How long does it take to put policy into place? Well, there is a, obviously there's, there's a clear process and we see that as it goes through. There needs to be a report that, uh, that's requested to come to council. That can take up to two, two months you know, to do that and do it properly because you need to get, as we've said, all of those things in place. Then a council can make a decision on that as to which way it goes and that, that can then be enacted as quickly or as slowly as depending on what that policy actually means. It could mean a whole shift in an operational arm of council, so it's a, it's a massive change, depending on what that is. But we'll look at, and I think there was a few ideas floating around tonight, part of the process in early January is to look at a variety of options in which we can give confidence to the community in a clear direction that our corporate plan is talking to the, the green infrastructure plan, okay, that's important, and that we're actually doing what we can as quickly as we possibly can, not waiting for 2025. Yeah, yeah. Is this an option or what's going on? We cannot have one on Mulleries Road happen ever again. Yeah, well, I'm not, here, I'm not here tonight to say that that will never happen again, okay? What I am here tonight is to say we've listened to you and we're working through the process to make sure that we can do all we can to get a balance right across the area. Who was first? There's a, there's a few up, up the back, sorry. Is it because this decision making takes such time, yeah. is it hard to put a stop on the removal of any old growth trees until these decisions are made? It would be lovely in theory to think we could do that in a lot of areas, not just what we're talking about here, but a lot of areas. Okay? That is absolutely impossible to do from a local government perspective or a state government perspective because there's act, there's an act for both local government, there's a state planning act. You can you just cannot do it. Okay? You just cannot do it. If we were to say, right, let's stop development tomorrow, it just won't happen. It just won't happen. So it's impractical. What we're talking about tonight is practical ways to find solutions. And that's what we're committing to tonight. I'll leave one more question if we need to go. I'm not sure who was first there, but you've been very patient in the middle. What I'd like to know is they're draining the Reese Road um, development into concrete. It put down five foot pipes down the bottom end of Barrett's Road and it's going into concrete. Mm -hmm. The damage that that is going to cause when all this is draining, can't we stop it? Can't we do something about it? So the drains, the drains are already in there. Is that, they're putting it in now. They're putting it in now. Okay, well, it would be part of the approval that's gone through. It would be very difficult to stop that if it's already started. There was one, that's it? We better stop it. Thanks, everyone. Look, I'll, I'll hang around as all the councillors after this, so please come and grab us. But I can't thank you enough for your commitment, right? Oh, okay. Great.
Please see them individually. I'd like to thank you all for coming. And I'd just like to emphasise to Deputy Mayor McDonald and the other councillors that uh, time is of the essence. The community is definitely watching. And one way to fast track this is to learn from the experiences of the other councils who already have some laws and protections in place. So certainly investigating what they have and what they learnt work and what didn't work is a way for us to accelerate what we need here. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh,